Ever wonder just how those hedge funds made so much money over the years? Well, lately, that turns out to be incorrect. This year, hedge funds will deliver their second worst ever, according to one industry insider. Simon Lack has spent 30 years in New York, much of it at J.P. Morgan, where he was a seed funder to hedge funds and private equity. He's recently written a tell-all book, The Hedge Fund Mirage, The Illusion of Big Money and Why It's Too Good to Be True. I spoke to him earlier from New York. Simon Lack, welcome to the program. Thank you, Tiggy. Good to be on. Well, in the 1990s, a hedge fund was this mystical firm, I'm thinking of Tiger or Quantum, uh, that was run by a very, very private individual that made squillions of dollars. What has changed? Well, it's size. I mean, in the, in the 90s, hedge fund investors did really well. There just weren't that many of them. And of course, you know, in investing, size is often the enemy of success. And a lot of other people started investing, particularly after the dot-com bubble burst in 01. And uh, it became harder and harder for the industry to generate the returns it had done as the assets grew. Now, you've got this devastating statistic. If, if all the money that's ever been invested in hedge funds had been put into Treasury bills instead, the result would have been twice as good. So we're talking about less than 3% return, are we? Yeah, I mean, I got 2.1% as the internal rate of return or the asset-weighted return for the whole industry. And the thing is that in the hedge fund industry generally, investors look at the return on the first dollar invested, rather like with mutual funds or unit trusts in the UK, instead of looking at what the aggregate investor has done. So there's no doubt that investors who were in hedge funds early in the 90s did well, but so much more money flowed in and returns steadily went south that overall, absolutely, if, if all of the money had ever been invested in Treasury bills instead, then in aggregate investors would have done better. Now, you've had a ding-dong over this with the hedge fund peak body, Aimer, who reckoned that the average returns are more like 9% from, I think, 94 to 2011. Uh, you say they're ignoring the returns over the last five years and that the market has now changed. Have they come back to you on this? No, actually, I was thrilled that they wrote that piece because it really brings the debate out into the open. And in fact, what they show is that the average return has been 9% since I think they go back to 1993. And their own numbers show that for the first five years of that time, so in the mid-90s, the average return was 12. And the most recent five years, it was two, when the industry was 20 times as big. So the question for the user of that analysis is, you know, should I assume the last five years is just as important as the first five? Or should I assign a little bit more importance to the more recent history when the industry looks a lot more like it does today? You know, AIMA is really a marketing group for hedge funds. And in my opinion, uh, I think investors would be better served if AIMA was trying to get a better deal for clients, focusing on fees and transparency and liquidity, as opposed to, uh, you know, promoting uh, a set of returns that are not really meaningful in terms of trying to figure out where to invest in the future. What about fees in the hedge fund business? Just how big are they? Well, I mean, everybody knows fees are indefensible. I mean, my math showed that 84% of all the profits that have been made had been taken by managers and another 14% by funds of hedge funds, which was 98%. So there's a, on my blog, there's a pie chart that basically shows a 2% left went to clients. And that was through 2010. So last year, because hedge funds lost money, in fact, it's even worse than that. So without doubt, fees have consumed all the money. Hedge funds have actually been a great investment. It's just that the returns, the profits on those investments haven't made their way back to the investors. They've really stayed within the industry. So that's why a lot of people have become rich running hedge funds. Simon, just how did you get access to this sort of information? Because before you, it hadn't really come out in the media. It's, it's really quite amazing. It's public information. It is out there in the public domain. It's just that investors haven't looked at the data this way. There's an academic paper uh, which I came across, which is written by uh, a couple of researchers in the US, and they had figured out the same thing. And I contacted one of them, Ilya Dichev, I talk about in my book. And I said, this is just a huge story. I mean, how come this isn't, you know, more widely known? I, I just found it amazing that more people hadn't really focused on this asset weighted return, just the return on all of the assets, as opposed to just taking the simple average every year, because size is such a huge factor in the hedge fund industry. So it's caveat emptor yet again for investors. Uh, but you say investors must demand transparency. But how can they in a world of uh, hedge funds with private equity and, uh, and derivatives and lots of opaque products, really? 
Hedge funds have actually gotten away with providing less transparency than any other asset class uh, you could think of. So how should investors get that? They should be more demanding. They should negotiate more aggressively on fees, on transparency, on access to capital. They should demand separately managed accounts. And they should be willing to say, if I can't invest on terms that are at least equivalent to how I access other strategies, then I won't invest. And you know, when I started researching the book, I thought the hedge fund industry had actually perpetrated an enormous, um, not a fraud, but they'd ripped a lot of people off. But as I thought about it more, it's really the investors that are to, that are to blame. The investors have willingly accepted steadily worsening terms for many, many years without being, without pushing back and without being more demanding. Looking more broadly at Europe now, do you think there's any chance that a hedge fund could make a big bet against Europe in some way, in the same way that Soros did against the pound? Uh, hedge funds may have big positions on that, but I don't think a hedge fund is responsible for a source of systemic risk in the marketplace. I mean, hedge funds, listen, I'm a critic of hedge funds. Hedge funds didn't cause what happened in 2008. Hedge funds are definitely not causing the problems that are happening in Europe. Those are really self-inflicted political uh, wounds that, that have been made. So uh, I don't think hedge funds are to blame for that. You were at the great house of JP Morgan for years. Were you surprised to hear of the recent trading loss of $2 billion, perhaps going up to $6 billion? And doesn't this really say that even the most reputable of our big banks are prepared to take unacceptable risks? I mean, I'm staggered. You know, it's a long time since I was in that part of the business. Uh, Ina Drew, the former CIO, is somebody I've known for many years. And uh, she absolutely had that job on merit. She's a f fantastically talented individual. And I feel, I'm sure she's devastated. I'm utterly shocked. I would never, ever have imagined that, uh, the, you know, that she could oversee something like that. And, uh, you know, it's a great company. I have nothing but good things to say about JP Morgan. Simon Lack, fascinating to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for taking interest in it.